Hi, I'm author Stephen McGee and I wrote Health Forensics and Hypoxia, Mental Illness and Chronic Fatigue and we're here to talk about a subject of these books and that is health and mental illness and altitude. So we have this book here, it's called Toxic Altitude, there I am. That's the Keck Observatory I'm standing in. Oh, that's Mauna Kea, the top of Mauna Kea. And these are the telescopes on top of Mauna Kea. So that's the Keck Observatory. So that's Keck 1. And this is the Subaru telescope over here. And we're in a very high radiation environment. And also something that you can't see. It's a hypoxic environment, hence the hypoxia in this title, and that's me standing on top of the Keck Observatory atop Mauna Kea. So we're here to talk about altitude sickness progression. We're on page 363 of Toxic Altitude, and Toxic Altitude's a pretty thick book, and it goes to 461 pages. Right there. So altitude sickness progression. So this is the very latest research that I have done into altitude sickness. And I have a condition called altitude hypersensitivity. And basically that means I get very, very sick from altitude sickness when I go above 1000 feet. So it's a new condition which I characterized in 2021 and 2022 on the island of Hawaii. And the conclusions I came up to with this altitude sickness progression is you can actually get altitude sickness at sea level. And this occurs in damaged bodies. So we're seeing a lot of damage occurring in people from hypoxic exposures from COVID-19. and. I'm of the belief that some of these people actually have altitude sickness at sea level from that damage. So something to be aware of with damaged bodies is that it lowers the altitude, the altitude sickness occurs at. So the next one on this list is above sea level to 4,900 feet. And that is called altitude hypersensitivity, which I have and acclimatization only occurs near sea level. So I have to live below a thousand feet near sea level to stay healthy. So as you go up, we go to 2000 to 4900 feet, you start seeing fatigue, lethargy, depression, and happy hypoxia. And this has been observed by the medical profession in cities at these altitudes. So this is the traditional start of altitude sickness here, above 4,900 feet. So it's officially recognized onset of high altitude sickness. So above 4,900 feet, you will start to see sickness in people that are sea level adapted humans. And you'll also see it if they have some strange health issues. So above 6,500 feet, we get the onset of central sleep apnea when sleeping. So this is something not a lot of people are aware of, is that you get sleep apnea when you sleep at high altitudes. And I had never heard anybody discuss that during the time I worked in high altitude professional astronomy. But it's very well known to the medical community. Uh, particularly the medical community that serves high altitude areas such as Colorado. So you start getting a lot of health issues coming out of that sleep apnea and uh, you start to see nervous system disorders. So above 6,900 feet we start seeing changes in the blood and the saturation starts to decrease at that altitude. So this this number here is a number that a lot of people will recognize, 8,000 feet. That's the typical airplane cabin pressurization. So when you travel on an airplane, the 
airplane cabin is typically pressurized to 8,000 feet. So above 8,000 feet, the blood oxygen starts dropping. So you may only have a reading of around 92% above 8,000 feet. And that's in healthy sea level adaptive people. If you're sick, your blood oxygen may well be significantly lower. So health issues start to be observed and a couple of conditions in the high altitude community start showing up called HAPE and HACE. So one affects the brain and the other affects the lungs. So above 9,200 feet, we start seeing the blood oxygen fall below the dangerous to health level of 88% in healthy people. So this is a critical number right here, this 9,200 feet. And it's one of the reasons why you see airplane cabins pressurized 8,000 feet, it's to prevent this. So blood oxygen starts becoming a feature above 9,200 feet. And you'll start to get the symptoms of hypoxia. So this is a, another big number in the profession. Above 10,000 feet, you start seeing brain issues. Confusion, forgetfulness, mistakes. Uh, mountain climbers will only ascend 1,500 feet daily above this altitude because of those conditions. They're very, very serious and you need to acclimatize to prevent them from occurring above 10,000 feet. So let's turn the page. So, the next one is above 11,500 feet. You start seeing the onset of very high altitude sickness and brain functioning is severely compromised. Health issues become far more diverse. So 11,500 feet is a big number in the high altitude community and it's the start of a very high altitude sickness. So if you keep going up above 12,500 feet, you need continuous administration of oxygen to reduce brain functioning issues and systemic damage for aviation crews. So your pilot of your airplane needs to take oxygen to fly the plane above 12,500 feet. So that is a very well recognized altitude in the aviation community. So let's keep going. So 13,000 feet, blood acclimatization will require 45.6 days in a sea level adapted human. So what we're talking about is acclimatization. So you need 45 days of the altitude to acclimatize if you're a sea level adapted human. So that's when all the measurable changes stop occurring in the body. It takes 45 days for that to, to occur. So here's an interesting number, 13,800 feet. Summit brain is acknowledged to occur in professional astronomy observatory workers on Mauna Kea in Hawaii requiring treatment with over-the-counter medications and oxygen administration. So, very well acknowledged in the professional astronomy community atop Mauna Kea in Hawaii that the workers are developing summit brain and it needs to be treated. So 16,400 feet most people will have central sleep apnea during sleep. So this is not one or two people, this is like almost everybody. Almost everybody at 16,400 feet has central sleep apnea. And that can cause a wide range of problems in the body. So we're going to keep going. 16,700 feet, highest permanent settlement of La Reconada. So that's where people stop living. So around the world, you will find very, very few people above 16,700 feet. So we're gonna to go to 18,000 feet. What's going on at 18,000 feet? Onset of extreme altitude sickness. A wide range of mental and physical illness occurs above 18,000 feet. So that's consistent with this book. So 19,520 feet. Humans have survived for just two years at that altitude. So this, we're getting into the point where people cannot survive at 19,520 feet. 
So long-term survival is virtually impossible at that altitude. So 24,600 feet, sleeping becomes very difficult, digesting food is near impossible, and the risk of HAEP or haste increases greatly. So you're in the process of dying. That's basically what that's saying. You're, you're, if you stay there, you're probably going to die. So your functioning, your bodily functioning is shutting down at 24,600 feet. So above 26,000 feet, death zone, where short-term survival is difficult. There are only 14 mountain peaks on Earth in this zone. So there's not a lot above 26,000 feet on planet Earth. It's very hard to find places above 26,000 feet on planet Earth. And you, you generally need a lot of money to get to them. So this is uh, very much in the professional mountain climbing community right here. And we finish off with altitude sickness is a poorly defined sickness. And that was my conclusion when I was writing this book, this toxic altitude, that there was a lot of stuff I wasn't told about altitude sickness by the professional astronomy community. And my working in the professional astronomy community, particularly atop Mauna Kea in Hawaii, led to me developing hypoxia, mental illness, and chronic fatigue. And I was very, very sick for many, many years, and I eventually figured out I had the altitude hypersensitivity, high altitude disease, and I figured out how to treat it. So you don't know how to treat the sickness that I had. It's in this book. It's toxic altitude. You'll find the treatments that I do to treat the hypoxia, the mental illness, and the chronic fatigue. I've made a pretty good recovery using the treatments that are in this book. So, If you're interested in human health, health forensics uh, was the first of the major books I did in human health. And if you're interested in altitude sickness of your like airline cabin crew, in the space industry, space tourism, or you know, you're working at a ski resort on top of a mountain, mountain climber, anyone who's going to high altitude, high altitude hikers, I recommend you read this book, Toxic Altitude. It'll uh, clear up a lot of the altitude sickness mysteries that people are being subjected to through a lack of information. There's a lot of information in this book on the subject. And if you've got to the point that I did and you're starting to see mental illness and chronic fatigue and low blood oxygen that's causing hypoxia, I recommend you read this book. It has a lot of uh, information in that I developed to recover from the conditions. You can't cure this condition. It's a treatment. There is no known cure. And uh, there are some solutions in these books that you may find interesting. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I wish you the very best of health. Thank you.